Uh, Gordon Weiss, um, how did such a vast massacre and so much abuse on both sides um, occur whilst the UN was actually on the ground in Sri Lanka? Well, that was the entire point or one of the points of the, of the Sri Lankan government and army's management of the war. It was intended that nobody should be able to see what was going on. And any foreign journalist who was working on the ground in Sri Lanka uh, understood that because nobody was able to get near the front lines. Uh, one of the things I expect we'll see in the next few weeks as the government of Sri Lanka mounts a defence is they will argue that journalists had access. But in fact, that's not true. It was a silent war. But that nobody on the ground included you, included the United Nations, um, who were not anywhere near the theatre. Well, we did have members of staff inside the zone. They had been, in fact, kept there by the Tamil Tigers, but they were Tamil members of staff. Uh, a couple of members of staff did get caught inside the siege zone uh, on one of the convoys, and they were bombarded by government of Sri Lanka forces. But this is an incredible uh, idea that the United Nations was dependent for its information upon people who were bound to have some affinity with what was happening. Where were the international observers as we know them? Well, there were no UN observers as such. There were only humanitarian uh, um, operations on the ground. Agencies such as the uh, High Commission for Refugees and the United Nations Children's Fund. So there were no formal UN observers. And when the government insisted in 2008 that the UN agencies should pull out of the area, in which the uh, Tamil Tigers were operating, the UN was compelled to pull out, and they did, and it effectively left no foreign observers there to observe what was happening. Could the UN have done more? I think that's clear from this UN panel report. They say that very specifically, that there were actions that might have led to uh, less civilian deaths. The UN panel report is quite clear about that. Look, it was, it was a very difficult environment and certainly all the UN people that I observed, or the vast majority, did their very best. But this is cutting edge stuff. This is the hard edge of humanitarian work and this is Sri Lanka's Srebrenica moment. In fact, it's a Srebrenica moment for the rest of the world. But you were the UN spokesman. You were the conduit through whom a great deal of information could have reached the outside world that didn't. Why didn't the UN publish its figures noisily repeatedly? Well, it's another one of the points that is made in the UN panel report. It says that the UN should have taken whatever casualty figures it had and made use of those as leverage to stop uh, what the government of Sri Lanka was doing. And that was a full frontal assault taking very little notice of uh, the civilians inside the zone. I was certainly part of that UN structure. I bear my, I bear my portion of the, uh, of the responsibility and blame for that. You call this a Srebrenica moment. What should happen now? Again, the UN panel is very clear about this. It, it, it says that any likelihood of a meaningful judicial inquiry coming from inside Sri Lanka is extremely unlikely. Uh, and it says that there ought to be an international inquiry into serious allegations, serious and credible allegations of mass war crimes in Sri Lanka. This is not an oil producing country. Sri Lanka is you know, another country. Um, how is it uh, that more pressure hasn't been put on Sri Lanka by the international community? Well, it's one of, the, uh, one of the things I discuss, in fact, in my book, is that Sri Lanka slipped through the cracks in a particular geopolitical moment, and that is when the Obama administration had just come to office in, uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, in, in the United States, I'm sorry, and, uh, and uh, China was on the, in the, on the ascendancy. China was effectively able to protect Sri Lanka inside the Security Council, and other countries such as India bear their proportion of the blame for this, because they protected uh, Sri Lanka in other forums, such as the UN uh, Human Rights Council, which, uh, which uh, failed to, to make any move to arrest Sri Lanka's full-on assault. Haven't you just described the architecture that will uh, precisely prevent anything being done, even now that we know so much suffering occurred? I think that the sheer strength of this report is designed so that that should not happen. I think it will be very difficult for any of the great powers to ignore now 
what went on in Sri Lanka. I think it might have happened, it may well have been swept under the carpet, but this panel report has reversed the tide and I think we will see action. I believe that we will eventually see a war crimes process. Well, uh, China has bunkering rights in, uh, in Sri Lanka and they're absolutely critical in the balance of power with India. Why on earth should that uh, permit them then to go and attack Sri Lanka in the UN? Well, that's true, but uh, the record shows that China is increasingly conscious of its role and reputation as a great power. Uh, it's, uh, um, it gave way in Libya. It eventually gave way in Sudan. I believe that with uh, the types of allegations that are coming out now, about tens of thousands of civilian dead, that it would be very difficult for China as a responsible member of the international community to ignore these allegations and, and, uh, and block any action in the Security Council. Talking to us there from Australia, you won't be unaware of the World Cup that's just been uh, focused very much on Sri Lanka. Should Sri Lanka be uh, hosting things like uh, international events like cricket? Indeed, should they be welcomed abroad? And how far does this culpability go? Right to the top, should the president be allowed uh, around the world with free range? Well, I think that cult culpability rests on a on a fairly narrow range of uh, senior leaders in Sri Lanka and a lot of those people are on the record uh, for their actions and for their statements during the war and for their attempts to obscure what was actually going on. So I, I believe that any inquiry will be narrowing on the circle of people around the Rajapaksa family in, in Sri Lanka who were ultimately responsible for, for driving and steering and making the decisions over this offensive. And when it comes down to the UN, who's to blame? I, I, look, I mean, I think there are a range of people who would say that they bear responsibility for this. Uh, I think we'll have to wait until we see an inquiry coming out of the UN. There will be an inquiry, a review from the UN, looking at what happened in Sri Lanka, what went wrong. Um, and I, I prefer to wait and see what they come up with rather than second guess them at the moment. A final question, Gordon Weiss. Um, the UN's been very quick to move on Libya. Why so slow over Sri Lanka? Well, I think this has got to do with the nature of modern warfare and the management of, uh, of information. The Sri Lankans were extremely successful, and it's now a matter of record, at hiding what was going on. In Libya, it was completely different. Libya was, uh, was uh, um, a, a war of the communications revolution. In Sri Lanka, uh, communications were largely controlled by the government and the narrative of war was very much controlled by the government of Sri Lanka. Gordon Weiss, thank you very much indeed for talking to us.